I've been teased pretty much since I was this high about the 15 odd Cambodian orphans that would one day probably be spilling out of my terribly disorderly house. And although this exact scenario hasn't come to pass, I won't let you see the state of my cupboards. Um, <clears throat> and this idea that I had that I would somehow end up being a mother to children who had nowhere else to go strongly influenced the decision that I made to start a life with my partner who shares my beliefs and who adopted our son some 10 years before I came along and joined the family. And that has strongly influenced the way that we live our lives. At the same time, my own parents gave me the chance to live my life differently to how I began it. So it was a cycle that continued. Um, so from this background, the story, the idea that I want to share with you today is the idea of a world without unwanted children. And I should make explicit from the outset that when I say unwanted children, I don't mean, just mean unplanned pregnancies. I also mean children who are abused, abandoned, children who are born within child marriages, children who are disposable for whatever reason. And I want to share this idea with you not only because I feel so strongly about it, but because I believe that it can and should be attainable. It should actually be something that we can achieve quite easily. It shouldn't be so far out of our reach. And yet, amazingly, it seems so impossible. Yet, I believe we can do this thing. Now, Jolie Little of the National Right to Life pointed out earlier this year that worldwide there are a lot more parents waiting to adopt than you would actually think. Um, it's actually most often the system that is failing to unite children with potential caregivers. And some frightening statistics for you. There are apparently approximately 147 million orphans in the world. About 250,000 of these are adopted annually. But each year, 14.5 million orphans age out of the system. Almost a fifth of these commit suicide before they turn 18 or end up in other unfavorable circumstances. I'll give you a moment to digest that. The fact is that everything of human origin hinges on how we treat our children. If every child that walked this earth were loved and nurtured and raised by the book, I can guarantee you that we would be living in a virtually problem-free world and those problems that we did have would be quickly fixable. The sum that we have is not difficult. Poverty, violent societies, and unstable homes make for troubled children who grow into unstable and volatile adults. If we make a mess of our children, we make a mess of our future. I say this not to sound like Stevie Wonder, but because there are actually enough empirical studies to back it up. It's a simple equation, and there are enough citations that tell us this over and over and over again. Rejected, unstable, and unloved children suffer significant emotional and developmental problems, and often develop behavioral problems as well, which often manifest as juvenile offenders, which later become mature offenders. It would be remiss at this point for me not to mention the Freakonomics study, which found, well, it was, it was actually not done by the Freakonomics authors, but it was cited in Freakonomics, which mentioned in certain American states where abortion was legalized, that the precise number of years at which crime would have peaked after abortion was legalized, there was a significant drop in crime at the precise age at which those offenders which would have been born in that year matured. So basically what you're looking at is a situation where the average age at which offenders would have matured, those offenders simply weren't born and the crime didn't occur. Now, I'm not saying this as a pro-abortion argument, I'll touch on that later. But what I'm trying to say to you is that there's a significant impact on our society through unwanted children. Childhood trauma is a factor in a significant percentage of mental illnesses, as well as a number of chronic physical illnesses. 
And yet, amazingly, we continue to make this chronic pig's ear of raising our children. Now, as I mentioned just now, I'm not interested in starting an argument about birth control or abortion. I'm not interested in saying to you what pro-lifers or pro-choices will say to you at this point. Because for me, the point is that whatever you say, accidents will always happen. And there will always be, whatever you believe regarding birth control or abortion, there will always be those children who fall through the cracks. And somehow, those are the children who end up being forgotten. And those are the human beings who end up just being left and be end up being used to make an argument or used to make a point. And those are the people that I'm interested in. Those are the people whose lives I'm interested in making a little bit better. A longitudinal Scandinavian study looked at the case studies of two control groups. A control group of just regular children versus a group of children whose mothers had wanted abortions but weren't granted the right. And the results were, you might find unsurprising, right into adulthood, adulthood, the unwanted children were more than twice as likely, twice as likely, to suffer social, emotional, and educational disadvantages. The unwanted children showed increased delinquency. They were a higher number of welfare recipients. They were a poorly educated citizenry and a greater number of psychiatric problems. If you want a greater number of horrors in the under unwanted children statistics, there was a further study done on filicide, or the murder of children, which found that 83% of horrific child murders were purely to get rid of unwanted children. A, a handful could be attributed to psychosis in parents, and a tiny little percentage to altruistic reasons, such as ending the suffering of a sick child. But overwhelmingly, it was just a parent that said, I don't want this child, bye now. I don't want to catalog atrocities here, but I want to make clear how severe the consequences are of this problem. And I want to touch on something else as well, which is babies born to child mothers and unplanned pregnancies within marriage and within forced marriages. This year, the UN's theme for the International Day of the Girl was child marriage. And I want to give you some stats here that will, I hope, horrify you as much as they horrified me. 10 million girls under the age of 18 are married off every year with little or no say in the matter. That's 100 million girls in the next decade. It goes without saying that these child brides have little control over the breeding they do. And in India, nearly 80% of married women of all ages have no access to birth control. So there are droves of unwanted children being born into marriages as well. And as pointed out by Desmond Tutu and Ella Blatt earlier this year, worldwide statistics show that child mothers who are giving birth to these unwanted babies are vulnerable to ill health, violence within their family, inadequate education, HIV, AIDS, and poverty, as are their children. And outside of child marriage, here are some last consequences that I want you to think about. Unwanted children at two years old had significantly lower cognitive test scores. Women who have unwanted children tend to have greater instability in their relationships, creating more unstable families for their other children. Unwanted babies are less likely to be breastfed and do not receive the benefits of breast milk, which means that they have lifelong health consequences, including poor cognitive development, higher risk of SIDS and certain cancers. Unwanted children exhibit higher levels of fearfulness and lower levels of verbal development, lower vocabulary skills, poorer physical and mental health. Unwanted children are more likely to be poor, drop out of high school. They have lower grade point averages, lower college aspirations, poorer school attendance records. So the facts that I want to draw your attention to here are that firstly, the consequences of having so many unwanted children are severe. Firstly, for the children themselves, and secondly, for the society as a whole. It is all of, our, it is all of us's problem. Secondly, 
that the droves of neglected, unwanted, and throwaway children that are walking this earth are walking this earth in all spheres of society. It is not just happening in poor societies or somewhere else. It is happening in the upper classes where maybe the kids are being raised by their playstations. It's happening in middle classes where maybe the kids are being sent to school and fed enough, but maybe a girl is being raped by her stepfather, but she's not important enough for her mother to step in. It's maybe happening in a conservative society where a girl is being married off at the age of 12 and sent off to make babies. It's happening in poor communities where a girl is being sent off to have a boyfriend in one of the local gangs because what will happen to her family if she doesn't? They're being born to university students who have too much to drink at a party or to schoolgirls who are experimenting in the lifts at Cavendish. It's happening everywhere. It's also happening to the mothers who are leaving them in dumpsters or tying them to train tracks or God knows what else. But it's happening everywhere. And it is everybody's problem. And what I want everybody to think about today is that the children who are growing up in these circumstances are affecting everybody. When, these, when we're looking at a world full of disposable children, what we are looking at is a world that is less healthy, less intelligent, more afraid, less confident, less ambitious, and a lot more broken. And if you repair those children, you're repairing the world for all of us. So that's what I want us to focus on today. I want us to focus on repairing those children. Because as much as I cherish an ideal where every child that is born is a planned and wanted and nurtured child, I realize that ideals are for sissies. It's never going to happen. What we have in front of us, though, is a reality that we can work, for, work with. There are actually enough of us here to ensure that nobody is a throwaway person. And this is the part where I notice that well-educated and wealthy people normally start to zone out because it's normally the part where people think, okay, well, it's actually the poor people who need to go and have their tubes tied because there's a hideous double standard that goes on here where most of us, if we see a family of five in Kailiche, we think, oh, God. And if you see a family of five in Bishop's Court, you think, oh, bless. And that is, to me, an absolutely hideous double standard. Because this is a problem that spans through the whole of society. And if you take, if you think of it logically, number one, we do not actually need NGOs or government to solve this problem. What we need is for everybody to get involved. And if you take this idea to its logical conclusion, you get the neat sort of mathematical, you get the neat mathematical answer that, all right, maybe if rich people stopped breeding altogether and each adopted 10 kids, the problem would go away. But that is not only sort of unethical and scientifically problematic, it also amounts to a kind of genocide because then you're saying a certain sector of the population isn't allowed to breed. And I don't know about you, but I always find that genocide is a problematic starting point. So... <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't want to go sort of that gung-ho, but what I would like all of us to think about is what if everybody just got involved to a certain extent. So if you want to get very involved, say, all right, if I am a wealthy person and everyone in this room counts as a wealthy person because you're all sitting here in nice clothes and under a warm roof, if you say, all right, when I come to planning my family, say I want to plan for a family of three, instead of having three biological children, what if I have two biological, biological children and adopt one? Or if you don't want to do that, if that's a little bit too hectic for you, what if you say, instead of adopting that one child, I take out an education policy with the price of one of my dinners out every month? and put two kids through university? What if I foster a child? Or if, if your heart breaks at the idea of taking a child in and sending them back, because that's not for everybody, it can hurt. What if you can't do that? What if you say, all right, I'll take a child out on weekends from an orphanage nearby? Or what if you say, 
I'm going to get involved in a literacy program and build up a relationship with a child. Because what for me is important is building up that personal relationship that says you are important. What I'm trying to advocate here is that every single one of us must get involved and that every single one of us has a moral obligation to, within our family planning, also plan for our extended human family. That is our moral obligation if we want this problem to go away. There are enough of us to go around to make it a whole lot better. If you have not been on the receiving end of someone reaching out to make that kind of difference, you will never know what it is. But speaking as someone who was once a thrown away child, I can tell you what a difference it makes when someone comes out with that personal touch towards your life and how much difference the lightest touch can make. I can tell you how much difference every life that you turn around can make and how much difference that person in turn turning around other lives can make. So what I want to leave you with today is the thought that you can imagine the world differently. You can imagine one day differently for one child every day. You can imagine life differently for one child. And if every one of you goes and imagines life differently for one child, we're talking about a very, very different world. And you will never know in yourself what a difference it makes, but believe me, it does. <laughs>